Welcome back to Neurodiverse Christian Couples. I'm Stephanie. Still Dan. Still Dan. Still Dan. Um, we have, are we actually um, doing some listener requested questions today? So we have had questions come in about um, chronic illness and neurodiverse marriage. We've had questions come in about building resiliency. And we already had Jana, our guest today, scheduled for that. So um, we're going to tackle those two listener questions. So let me tell you about Jana. Jana Smith is a certified nervous system and somatics coach with a master's degree in health education. Jana's experience with neurodiversity began in her family of origin, includes her own diagnosis of ADHD as an adult. She has had firsthand experience navigating chronic illness after a seven-year period debilitating symptoms. Jana found relief by learning how to build resilience through nervous system regulation, and she has made it her life's work to help others bounce back in life so they can thrive instead of just surviving. And Jana, when we met um, and we kind of talked about this before doing the show, you started seeing that a lot of people you were working with were in neurodiverse relationships. Is that correct? That's correct. As I've reflected back in just the um, brain retraining space that I've worked in in the past, looking back on a lot of those clients as I started to learn more about neurodiversity, some of them had disclosed that they had ADHD and some of them had disclosed that they were married to somebody on the spectrum. And I just started to think back and wonder if more of them were in that camp than I'd actually realized. Well, let's start as we usually do with kind of your personal story, because you had to work through, you're not just someone who went into the field, um, you had your own story of kind of chronic illness and um, working through becoming healthier. So let's start with your kind of personal story that led to your passion, and then we'll jump into some of our talking points. Sure. Well, you know, there's a huge connection between stress and chronic illness. And my first stress-related diagnosis actually came in when I was 21. I was in college and had married the man of my dreams eight months prior. And my husband and I were living next door to a bunch of our friends. We were part of a wonderful Christian group on campus. And really, I was in the prime of life. I didn't feel stressed out, but I'd been experiencing digestive symptoms for over a year at that point. So I finally went to the doctor and the diagnosis was reflux and IBS. And the doctor actually sat me down and said, this is related to stress. So you need to look at your life and reduce the amount of stress in your life. And I was completely dumbfounded because I didn't feel stressed. I wasn't even working yet. I was just a student. And so life felt pretty easy. I didn't even know what to do with his advice. And so, yeah, so it developed from there. And um, as the years went on and as we had children, more things added up. And then I actually began to really spiral into chronic daily symptoms. Um, Yeah. So were you already kind of in the field doing some work about stress reduction and um, chronic illness and central nervous system regulation, or did this kind of pivot your career more into that space? Great question. So I had studied health education and I was teaching health and health occupations and anatomy and physiology for high school students. And, you know, part of my training was about stress management and stress reduction. I took classes about that. And I sort of always knew somehow it wasn't landing for me, but I didn't know why I couldn't put my finger on it. And I had a hard time engaging in stress reduction activities. I had resistance to that. So I wasn't really in the field besides in my health classes about teaching about stress. It was when I became ill and then really not functioning for a long time that I started looking deeper and deeper for answers and came across the idea of nervous system regulation, began that journey, and then launched a career in that field. Well, this became interesting to me because we did some... um research in 2023. And from our large population, I took 20 or 21 couples um, to really talk about some things going on in their neurodiverse relationship. And some of the trends I saw, um, whether the woman was neurodivergent or neurotypical, if she was married to a neurodivergent man and not a neurotypical man, um, all of them had um, an autoimmune, one or more autoimmune issues. When I asked the neurodivergent men about stress, even those who were, would say they were in unhappy, um, unsatisfying relationships, there was two or three that had some IBS or some gastrointestinal issues, but they did not, they were not exhibiting the same amount of stress or being impacted the same as the female um, in this. And so there's no more research that needs to be done on this, but I want to now just kind of take us into that, how chronic, chronic illness is related to stress. 
And then when you're, I know your brain it processes well, things, then you want to jump in. So do you want to already jump in before I go there? Okay, all right. I, I have to. Sometimes I feel it, and so I have to, I have to check in. <laughs> I want to define some terms. Okay. Dan wants you to define terms, and I bet one of them is going to be stress. So let's start with a certified nervous system and somatics coach. Okay. Okay. Sure. So, um, in terms of the nervous system, you know, when the nervous system is dysregulated, and we'll define that in a minute. Uh, that begins to have all kinds of impacts on the body. So in terms of nervous system coaching, I'm looking at people's nervous system and what is the level of regulation or dysregulation. And then how can we use body-based techniques and then somatic techniques to help regulate the nervous system? Okay. So now what is somatic? Somatic is related to the body. And so when we're looking at the nervous system, about 80% of the messages of safety that the brain gathers come from our senses, from the way we sense our internal organs, from the way that we read the room and absorb information. And so as we teach people to connect to their bodies and learn how to develop those felt senses, we can help use the body then to establish safety when the nervous system is perceiving threat. All right, we can carry on now. Okay. Well, you know what, that ties into a conversation you and I had with Dr. Tony Atwood a while back that Dr. Tony said, sometimes people on the spectrum are very kind of dissociated from their body. And you said you kind of had that same until you started doing a keto, um, where you were kind of learning to be a little bit more in touch with your body that, you know, I think that does tie in that if maybe those who are neurodivergent, um, if they're not as in touch with their body and their brain is detecting things that are threats that may not be threats, that seems like that could be a pathway there. And then for the neurotypical wives, um, especially, un I want to make a point, usually it's undiagnosed neurodivergence in the marriage that usually is causing stress. I am seeing something different when people go into the marriage, knowing about the neurodivergency in the marriage, that does seem very different. Um, than decades of not having a diagnosis and the, and the issues of chronic stress. So for either party, let's kind of start then with the central nervous system and how chronic stress can be related to chronic illness and um, why it's so important to learn somatic responses and how why it's important to regulate your central nervous system. So I guess give us the basics on how chronic illness can lead to this, uh, the chronic stress can lead to chronic illness. Sure. Well, long-term nervous system dysregulation leaves us vulnerable to symptoms and eventually developing chronic conditions, including physical illnesses and mental health challenges. So let's talk a little bit about nervous system dysregulation. That occurs when the nervous system perceives a threat. So we don't have the ability to choose whether or not to dysregulate or what our brain is going to perceive as a threat. It just happens through an automatic unconscious process. So an example might be of how your hand jerks back when you touch a hot stove. You don't stop and think, oh, the stove is hot. I should pull my hand back. The process happens so quickly uh, outside of our conscious awareness. And that's what happens when the brain perceives stress. So whether it's uh, environmental type triggers or emotional type triggers, based on our patterning and our past, our brain will automatically go there. Now, if it's doing that often and frequently and responding to things that aren't real threats, then we're going to live in a baseline of constant dysregulation, which is connected to that idea of low-level stress. So when the body's under stress, if you think about the resources in the body, if the body is spending a lot of energy trying to protect itself or run away from a tiger or avoid danger, it's going to funnel resources away from systems like the digestive system, like the immune system. And that's when you can start to see the symptoms pop up of digestive issues or immune or autoimmune issues, pain, fatigue, et cetera. And as that goes on, undealt with, because oftentimes we don't know what to do. We don't know quite what's wrong. We don't know, like when I was young, I didn't even feel like I was stressed because my baseline, that was my norm. I had sort of grown up that way. So I didn't know what to hone in on. Then as that goes on long-term, we can develop more actual illnesses. And that's when the diagnoses start coming in. Anything else? Need to defining or asking at this point? Tracking? Okay, we're tracking. All right. So um, 
define and explain then the cause of the, the anybody can get dysregulated. Usually when we hear the word dysregulated, people go to, oh, that's ADHD or just neurodivergent folks that get dysregulated. So maybe that looks different into what it's like a met, meltdown or an outward manifestation or a shutdown. Um, but neurotypicals um, can get dysregulated too. And it might look different in our immune system and how we process that. So we kind of talk a little bit about neurotype and personality, attachment, um, stress levels, perception of safety, kind of bring all that um, together on, on things that are practical that might be happening in a neurodiverse relationship. Absolutely. So, you know, we kind of know it's a given that neurodiverse brains dysregulate faster than neurotypical brains, but you're absolutely right. Anyone's brain can dysregulate. Um, and that can also come from past trauma, their current stress level. Now, it, the way that our brains work is they often mirror the other brains in the room. So for a neurotypical, if they're living with someone with a neurodiverse brain and that brain is dysregulating frequently, they are going to start dysregulating more frequently. So you can see that ripple effect in the home. Um, and then in terms of attachment styles, so often the stereotype is that the neurotypical wife has a more anxious attachment and the neurodiverse husband may be more avoidant. And each time that there's a bid for connection or a rupture there and not a repair, that can contribute to that baseline level of stress and dysregulation for the wife. So there are a lot of different factors that can come in and affect our propensity to, to dysregulate um, and different situations that can create that and without proper support then can perpetuate more and more of a dysregulation cycle. You're thinking and processing, so I don't know if I'm to mm. pause because you're okay. All right. Okay. Got it. All right. Um, this was something we've been talking about too, because you were you know, saying that, man, I wish there was something we could have a guest or talk about resiliency, right? So dysregulation and stress and this kind of thing can continue to happen. Now do you have a question? Yeah. So we've talked a lot about hearing before. And it's, I, I guess uh, I want to, Re resurface that idea because she mentioned it that the predominant I don't I don't know how to express it otherwise perhaps the predominant feel in the house is what then takes on the persona of the house mm -hmm. um, which then means it's important that if you want to change that the predominant feel needs to make an attempt to reduce that stress we've used the term non anxious presence to reduce the entire household's stress simply because of mirroring. Everyone in the house is now mirroring the strongest force. And it's just another one of those opportunities to recognize just how important the your presence is. Right, Whether you recognize that you're anxious or not anxious or have any awareness of what's going on, your presence in the room is felt and perhaps subconsciously mirrored by everyone else there. Yeah. Well, yeah, I have a question. I want to follow up on that, but I want to let you answer what he said because something else you said kind of caught my thinking too. Sure. So you're absolutely right, Dan. And the amazing thing is as each person has the invitation to work on themselves, the more that we differentiate or kind of unentangle ourselves from being enmeshed, the more that we have the ability to regulate our own nervous system independent of what the other nervous systems in the room are doing. So we don't necessarily come into the situation with the ability to do that, but we can learn and grow so that we can say, you know what, you might be anxious right now, but I can emotionally step back and I can use tools to support myself so that I'm okay, even if I see that you're not okay and vice versa you can learn that if I'm not okay, that can be okay for you. And you can you can say something kind and validating, and then you can step back and allow me to regulate myself. And it's not our job to regulate each other. So as we own our own regulation and we step back from having to fix or help or not dysregulate the other people around us, that gives us some freedom to be empowered to make our own system as resilient as possible. 
And so kind of what I'm hearing you say too, so despite, um, you know, if if the pattern or the cycle in the relationship has become that dysregulation is the norm, it doesn't even take one party to truly be dysregulated to start to dysregulate the other. So for example, if you've been at this 10 years and it's stressful and you're um, either, like you said, distant pursuer, the one who's avoidant is constantly isolating. So the other pursuer is constantly con- you know, chasing them down and then not getting emotional needs met. Or one is a, a big exploder and then that's intimidating and fearful for others in the home. When your brain starts to see the other person or the other brain is a threat, even on a quiet day, your spouse walks through, they didn't even do anything, but the anticipation that something could happen or there could be a stressful moment, maybe for him is, oh my goodness, she's going to ask me to do something connecting with her. Or maybe for her, it's all I want to do is ask this, but he's going to explode if I ask that question. So even all that internal dialogue's going on and nothing's actually been said, but can still be feeding that dysregulation chronic pattern. So I like what you said that we can we can learn to regulate ourselves and do our own work despite what the marriage is going to do. I can be like, I'm going to be okay and I'm going to learn to regulate my central nervous system. I've got to maybe set some boundaries um, on some other things, but I can, I'm not going to be codependent on this relationship to stay regulated either. Um, would that be accurate? Absolutely. That's exactly what we're shooting for because we can only control ourselves. So we can get as healthy as possible. And the nice thing is that there is sort of a mirroring back effect. So as we settle our nervous system, it is going to positively impact other people in the household, even if they aren't doing their own work. It won't change it all the way, but it's going to move it in the right direction. And it may pique their interest to do some of that work themselves if they're feeling the benefit. So I also want to speak to because sometimes um, Christian counselors and pastors are listening to this um, who believe that all marriage work should be done under the same roof and you never, ever separate. But so I kind of want to bring in because this happens a lot um, for some of the clients I'm working with is uh, maybe there is so much dysregulation and so much uncertainty and the wife is going to be like, I'm going to be OK. I'm going to do my own work. I'm going to um, work on my central nervous system. I'm going to you know take on all the things. But it's so constant and there's abuse or emotional or um, psychological or constant spiritual abuse going on that no matter what she's doing, she cannot do it if they are living in the same space. So in trying to do that own work, sometimes you can't do it under the same house. Like if it has gotten really tense and really escalated, um, and um, especially if somebody has been diagnosed with a chronic illness or autoimmune or something like that, you might have to be in separate spaces to kind of let the brains calm down, to break the cycle, to not be feeding off of each other's mirror neurons and negative cycle. And so I just want pastors out there, when you say, no, all marriage work must be done under the same roof at the same time, you're not really understanding this chronic um, illness, this um, central nervous system dysregulation that even if a person wants to quote, take ownership and responsibility and do their own work, I guess I can't be responsible for my spouse and I can't be responsible for everything going on in the house. So we might have to separate to do our best work. Would you agree with that or disagree with that? Yeah, I absolutely agree with that. To use Dr. Jim Wilder's term, if you're both in enemy mode all the time, you, you almost have to step out of combat for a little while to settle things. And oftentimes, too, in terms of the way that our neurochemistry works, the brain is used to whatever it has established as the norm. And so there can be a bit of a neurochemical addiction to our dance and our dynamic. So, for example, if there's the pursuer and even if it leads to a fight, they're at least getting a neurochemical hit of some kind of connection, even if it wasn't the kind of connection they wanted and needed and it doesn't feel safe their brain is still going to crave that. So after some amount of time of not enough interaction or not enough engagement, their brain will unconsciously drive them to engage or pick a fight just to create the neurochemical connection. So yeah, oftentimes we do have to step back and create space. 
And I want to piggyback on that. We were just, before we were recording today, we were part of a neurodivergent coach um, group that was kind of talking about some of this. And I mentioned that um, sometimes, specifically the neurodivergent spouse might be anxious or hesitant on trying new things. And so some of them would say to me, okay, you're talking about changing neuropathways. You're talking about neuroplasticity and that sounds like a good thing, but like how much of that is going to change the true me? And so, you know, in the clinical world, we might call that treatment resistance. Um, They're just being completely defiant, which some do. I'm not saying that there aren't some who are just completely defiant about doing their work. But for those who really want to do it, but are kind of scared or anxious about like, what are doing these exercises? What, what might change the essence of me? You had a really brilliant response in the group. And so I'd love for you to kind of talk about that too. Sure. Yeah. When we're looking at changing the brain and the nervous system, the, the nervous system is operating in dysregulation because it is sure there's something dangerous. So it's going to kind of tenaciously hang on to that neurochemistry of stress and cortisol and adrenaline to try to keep us safe. So when we try to make changes and we move out of that, out of those nervous system states, our brain is going to neurochemically push back because we're disrupting homeostasis. So the the brain is going to resist those changes. And the example that I gave when we were having the conversation earlier is oftentimes when clients are working on regulating and they're bringing more calm and balance to their nervous system, and they're really mindful during the day to be aware of that and doing their work, the, one of the first things that'll often happen is they'll start having scary nightmares at night because the brain says, oh, well, they're sleeping. We haven't gotten our nor- normal neurochemical hit for the day. So it'll it'll flood the body with that neurochemistry when the person's not paying attention so that it can keep it in what it thinks is the normal balance. So it takes time and repetition to shift what the brain is used to so that it becomes a new norm not to have that chemistry. And we can have that dynamic in a relationship too, where our brains are used to certain kinds of interactions and it feels weird or uncomfortable or scary or vulnerable to step out of that. It almost feels vulnerable not to have an argument or a conflict or an intense situation if that's been happening once or twice a week because your brain says, oh no, something's different. I don't want to change. Mm -hmm. 